Dummerston Conservation Commission and the Dummerston Historical Society. And I want to tell you just to, um, for a moment uh, about the Conservation Commission, and then we're going to turn it over to Jess Robinson, who is the state archaeologist, who I know you're both anxious to hear. Um, we need to put on these programs because we have a strong commitment to not only Dummerston, but the whole area to make sure that everybody knows what's going on here, what's happening environmentally, historically, so that we can preserve it into the future. And part of doing that is educating the kids in the schools, and we give a lot of money, the Conservation Commission does, so that there are special environmental education programs in the Dummerston School. So you, that's so some of your donations tonight will go toward that. We're splitting the donations with the Historical Society. And I'll let you take it from here. Last year, I gave um, a, a lecture to maybe some of you down here, a presentation. And uh, full disclosure, that was the presentation. So uh, when I was asked to do part two, I was like, hmm. Uh, I, have, I didn't quite finish up last time, so there was some of that. Um, but a lot of the other um, uh, presentations, lectures I gave are kind of specialized to one particular group or another. And so um, I endeavored to sort of mix some of that in, keeping it to the recent, um, relatively recent um, uh, pre-contact and then early uh, uh, contact periods. And hopefully I can weave it into a compelling cohesive tale in about an hour or so. Um, and we have several members of uh, uh, the uh, Abnaki here tonight, and so I'm, I'm grateful for their uh, presence and participation. So I think I might have begun some of this last year when I was here, but um, just to reiterate as a good starting point, uh, archaeologists, um, perhaps unfortunately, divide uh, uh, periods of time, periods of the human past, wherever we are in the world, into um, you know, chunks of time that we call here in the Northeast periods. In uh, Mesoamerica, they refer to them as, as uh, pre-classic, post-classic. Anyway, they're divisions of time. In the Northeast, they represent fairly broad sweeps of time. In this case, about a thousand year increment. And uh, the entire woodland period uh, it begins around 3,000 uh, um, years ago and ends around European contact, at which point uh, we refer to it as the contact period. And then eventually morphing sort of amorphously, depending upon when and where, into the historic period. And um, I did my PhD work on the early woodland period. Um, and uh, it involved a lot of research about a lot of different aspects. And so... Um, the first part of this lecture is going to be sort of um, uh, presenting uh, my sort of theoretical slant on some of the stuff of the early, early woodland. You might not find this, this in the standard textbooks because it's basically just my opinion, but it's my prerogative because I'm, I'm here. <laughs> um, and the early woodland period is a very, very uh, interesting time period in the eastern woodlands as a whole. Um, it is the time period of uh, what is referred to, or was once referred to, as the initiation of the mound builders uh, in the Ohio Valley and Illinois area of the American Bottom area. And um, it emerged quite quickly um, out of um, uh, a sort of horticultural or um, hunter-gatherer base of subsistence and then quite rapidly, mounds began to appear all throughout the Ohio Valley, um, at least it, as it was understood in the middle part of the century. Um, it was subsequently found out that many of these mounds were burial mounds. In fact, almost all of them during this earlier Adena period, named after um, an estate where the first major mound excavation took place, um, was located. And, um, here uh, is a, I think this will start on its own, but this is an excavation in 1939 um, of um, the Wright Mound. It says Adena Burial Mound, but it's actually not. It's the Wright Mound. And during the Depression era, uh, part of the Works Progress Administration um, uh, initiative was actually to hire archaeologists who would then hire teams of workers to go out and excavate 
uh, many archaeological sites, including, uh, somewhat unfortunately now, many burial mounds. So a lot of the information about this comes from these sort of make-work programs during the Depression in the 30s and 40s. And this is a very grainy video. You can still see they're digging in uh, uh, waistcoats and hats. That's pretty, you know, pretty uh, interesting. Um, but you'll see the size of the right mound um, quite rapidly. Very, very um, enormous burial mound. And during the, um, this earlier Adena mound building period, um, the mounds were accretional, meaning they would start with um, uh, several uh, burials, um, you know, perhaps only two, three, or four in the bottom. There would be an elaborate ceremony that took place. Then there would be a capping of dirt, and, the, the, and then the mound was established. And then the size of the burial was ultimately predicated about how many people were ultimately buried there. And so over uh, you know, uh, decades, uh, centuries, uh, the mounds would grow. Sometimes they remained very small. Sometimes they got to be enormous like the right mound. Underneath uh, some of these mounds, there was um, these elaborate um, ringed uh, paired uh, posts. And the reason that archaeologists can tell that they're uh, posts is, is only because of the negative impression that they left in the soil. Um, the wood has long since decayed in most cases. Um, but for early archaeologists in the 30s and 40s uh, operating uh, within you know, um, this milieu where they were excavating very large scale mounds very quickly, they thought that these uh, represented the, the, um, the uh, vestiges of um, circular houses. And this was very exciting because these represented the earliest sort of domestic structures that had been documented uh, in the archaeological record in the eastern woodlands. And indeed, even in Mesoamerica at the time. They had, Mesoamerica obviously had large stone temples and everything, but no one had really seen before just the average everyday dwelling. So this got people very excited. And at the same time, uh, in the, throughout the eastern woodlands, pottery begins to be uh, manufactured. It's not the first pottery made in, in North America that actually began around 4,500 years ago down in uh, uh, Georgia, but it's the first in the Eastern Woodlands. And when I refer to the Eastern Woodlands, that's roughly from the Mississippi all the way to Nova Scotia uh, and north of about uh, the Tennessee line. Uh, and then below that is, we often refer to it as the Southeast. Um, and originally this pottery was quite small, quite friable, um, and whoops. And um, uh, Charlie Paquin, who uh, is a, um, got his master's in replicating this early woodland pottery uh, by using only the materials that they had available, uh, that Native Americans would have had available um, at the time, with a couple of cheats, he admitted to me, um, uh, really um, gave a remarkable insight to me and to many others, anyone who has read his dissertation or has heard one of his lectures, on just how a, labor-intensive pottery making is, that you don't just build a fire and make one pot. It requires an immense amount of hardwood and sustained fires over a number of hours. And in fact, um, these were open-fired kilns, uh, that are not, not kilns, open fires. There was no kiln technology. And so Charlie actually found that you had to wait for a windy night and then try to channel the, the, the wind into the open fire to get the temperature hot enough to really um, make the pottery durable. And as the pottery got hotter and hotter, you can see in this image here, they incandesce at, at different colors. And you can actually, after a while, he, he began to know when a, pottery, uh, when a pot was fully um, fired by the, the glow that it gave off. Um, and so the introduction of pottery wasn't just a new vessel form. It was a, it was a different mode of living. It required a lot of planning. It required, um, it required you know, uh, significant effort in terms of gathering wood, staying in one place for a significant period of time to make the pottery, fire it, let it dry. Um, and archaeologists had often equated that, the introduction and use of pottery with the introduction of agriculture because otherwise portability would have seemed to have been the rule. Birch bark, things that were light and portable would have seemed to have been the better choice. Parenthetically, not directly related to discussion, but um, interesting to archeologists is when uh, pottery begins to be introduced, um, there's a byproduct, unintentional, uh, most likely to, to the Native Americans at the time, that um, in order to uh, drive air bubbles out of uh, the wet clay, 
um, because open fires weren't as even temperature, obviously, as a high temperature kiln. And so the fluctuations in temperature could cause tiny air bubbles in the pot to, to, to burst, which would then blow up the whole pot. Um, they would try to press um, uh, dowels into the sides of the pot uh, in order to drive out some of these air bubbles. And often, um, they would wrap these dowels in fabric. Um, and, and we call this fabric paddling. And uh, even millennia later, when we take you know, some uh, modeling clay and press it up against uh, a bit of pottery and pull it back, you can see the negative impression of the warp and weft and the kinds of fabric that they made. And my predecessor, uh, Jim Peterson, um, now, now deceased, um, this was his specialty. And he documented all different types of textile manufacture, um, very complex weaves, different materials, most commonly um, basswood and uh, um, basswood bark and uh, milkweed, but sometimes occasionally animal hair, woven into very distinctive and, and interesting patterns. Here's just a couple other examples of the, of the pot shirt and then the negative impression. And then some of the complex techniques that he documented. And so in the 30s and 40s, 50s, 60s still, 70s, there were some still dogged people hanging on. They thought that these uh, Adena mound builders and certainly the subsequent Hopewell mound building horizon which, where things got very complex, mounds were no longer made just as, as um, tombs or as burial locations but signaled all sorts of things, astrological alignments and everything. They signaled the introduction of sustained agriculture. And this was thought to be 3,000 years ago, the beginning of agriculture in uh, the Eastern Woodlands. Um, another notable aspect of uh, these mound building groups, and this had long been known to, uh, to extend even into the Northeast Great Lakes region and even out into Nova Scotia, was um, the exchange, again, arising out of um, almost no uh, uh, previous um, uh, you know, precedent, um, the exchange, long distance exchange in non-utilitarian materials, in, in, meaning that they were ultimately meant for non-utilitarian purposes in most cases, including um, shell from the Gulf Coast, copper from the Great Lakes in Nova Scotia, um, galena, which was used um, as a as a sort of ritual powder that shined also probably as a pigment and as a, as a, um, a body paint. Um, and then various types of chert from all over the Eastern Woodlands that were used to make um, stone tools, but often not utilitarian tools, things that were very elaborate and um, what we call hypertrophic or had extended or exaggerated dimensions or were um, afforded a level of skill in their manufacture that you wouldn't see in an ordinary implement. And this was further evidence to uh, the, the uh, early uh, generations of archaeologists studying this, that there was um, this crucible of complexity arising in the Ohio Valley, the Adena people. They um, became agricultural communities, farmers, and they traded long distance goods. And then that idea and cosmology uh, spread out all throughout the eastern woodlands. And in fact, even as late as 1994, uh, Jim Wright, a very um, uh, a well-known and respected archaeologist in Canada published this, The Spread of the Adena Burial Cult. Um, uh, the Missisquoi Abnaki have asked me not to show any photographs of the burial goods from Boucher, but here are some illustrations of a, of a cemetery that was located up in, um, up in uh, the Swanton Highgate area in Vermont, showing some of the materials that were interred with the individuals there. All of the artifacts have, have subsequently been reburied on site, and the, and the site is now co-owned by the state of Vermont and, uh, and uh, the Missisquoi, um, including uh, uh, columnella shell beads from uh, the Lightning Welk, um, uh, cohog disc beads, slate pendants, uh, blocked end tubular pipes, including um, in one of these pipes there was residue that was uh, analyzed in uh, the early 2000s and was found to have nicotine biomarkers and represents the earliest uh, tobacco, um, evidence for tobacco usage uh, in the eastern woodlands. Um, I'll just show this because it took me so long to make. Um, and it was uh, at the time that um, the Boucher site was occupied, 
It appears that uh, it was actually located on an island in uh, the Missisquoi River, and um, that, it that the actual um, uh, cemetery location was located on the highest point of the island. It's now um, uh, completely landlocked on all but the open river side. Um, and then just to give an idea without showing any photographs, um, uh, I, I had um, discussions with um, uh, the Missisquoi Abnaki when I was approaching this uh, as part of my dissertation and they, they said, yes, you can, you can use it because these archives are already sitting there, but you can't use any, you can't publish any photographs or any artifact photographs. And I said, okay. And um, so I, I had to get clever for my dissertation committee. So uh, I spent a lot of time learning SketchUp. Um, anyway, there's a very cool elaborate thing. Um, but um, another illustration of, of things um, that uh, were revealed from the Boucher Cemetery. Hmm, I don't like that. Uh, maybe if I can pause it, that'll stop it. Um, including, um, uh, things that were preserved because of the presence of copper, uh, which is a powerful antimicrobial agent, um, including this medicine bag containing the remains of um, uh, a, a, a pine marten leg, a rat snake uh, um, skeleton, um, a copper fish hook, uh, a bat wing, a raccoon baculum or penis bone, uh, and various other things within it, giving a very rare but obviously quite sacred um, uh, view into, um, into the ritual life of folks. Um, also studying the burial orientations um, that were located there, I can get a tentative, or we can get a tentative view that um, the sun was important to people buried there, that uh, all of the adults and um, uh, um, um, children above a certain age were buried within some direction to the rising or setting sun, but infants and very young children were not afforded that directionality. In fact, almost all of them were buried directly north or south. Um, and so the Boucher site is one of a number of sites in the Northeast that appears to have be related or was thought to be related to this Adena mound building complex. Again, the thought was originally that it spread from the Ohio heartland outward because of agriculture. But actually, when the dates started coming back in, and this is part of my PhD dissertation, we can see that the average uh, Adena complex radiocarbon date is about 2,100 years old. And all of the other things in the Northeast and in the Great Lakes region, I won't go into them here, but just trust me, are all earlier. Meaning that rather than the Ohio Valley being um, the sort of crucible of complexity from which you know, all these other peripheral things emerged, the periphery was participating in these exchange networks first and then ultimately coming down into the Ohio Valley with a more um, elaborate architectural manifestation, let's say, within, within mounds. So that gets to then, well, what was spurning this complexity? And that's a good question because I don't really have an answer. But I can say that on the ground, the everyday, discounting these very rare and elaborate cemeteries, um, the everyday life of Native Americans in the early woodland period was that of strictly hunter-gatherers. Um, here's a site on the Connecticut River up in Canaan um, that was excavated for a bridge replacement. Um, you can see here um, uh, just a couple excavation photos. And there were a number of radiocarbon dates dating to the early woodland period. Um, uh, this classic early Vanette one pottery, um, but all of the food remains there attest to hunter-gatherer life ways. Mammal and fish bones, nuts, no, uh, ag no um, agricultural cultigens at all. Another site further down um, uh, the uh, uh, Connecticut in Newberry, the Carson Farm site, was excavated in 1985. Here's just a few images of that. The OSHA would not be cool with this anymore. Um, you know, the, we used to call them phone booths where you'd go, get down, you know, really deep and, you know, that's not acceptable anymore. And again, this um, rare, relatively early woodland pottery, Vanette One pottery. Um, and this shirt actually was um, uh, uh, loaned to uh, Karine Taché, who's a professor at Queens College, uh, City University of New York, um, who specializes in trying to um, understand uh, residues and uh, biomarkers in the pots. And she analyzed just a small, tiny sample of this and found that it contained um, uh, fish lipids or fish fats. 
so that it was used to cook fish. Um, again, uh, across the state and the uh, Missisquoi Wildlife Refuge, um, uh, rare evidence of uh, the early woodland period, even though um, this was such an intensely occupied area. Um, and just a couple images of this, again, rare Vinette One pottery uh, with the fabric paddling, you can see pretty clearly on it. And um, you know, this is a slide I borrowed from Ellie Cowie, who's from um, Northeast Archaeology Research Center. And she, again, saw that um, the early woodland period is quite um, uh, sparsely represented uh, up, at, up at Missisquoi, even though this um, prominent and remarkable cemetery was right across the river. Um, and, and so she had a number of um, theories that uh, might have accounted for this. Um, but what we can see and what we have noticed uh, throughout the Eastern Woodlands since the time of, uh, of the 40s and 50s where people thought that these were emergent agricultural communities is that there was no agriculture. People were hunter-gatherers. Um, nevertheless, they were, they were um, participating in these long-distance exchange networks. They, um, for the first time in Vermont, um, you know, began to practice really um, bounded um, cemetery use, where before, at least as far as we understand from the archaeological record, cemeteries were more isolated or perhaps family affairs. Um, um, and what I argued in my PhD uh, dissertation was actually, rather than people being um, sort of uh, spurned on to complexity as a result of, uh, um, you know, thing, you know the, this new agriculture, this new environmental regime, um, instead that there was perhaps an environmental downturn to, that caused them to look more towards um, uh, cosmology, religion, um, the accumulation and perhaps celebration of, uh, of um, things that connoted supernatural um, or um, um, uh, you know, um, otherworldly principles, like, like copper, like shell, like um, things that wouldn't normally um, exist in, in their own hunter-gatherer milieu. And in turn, I suggest, tentatively, that um, power accrued to certain individuals, perhaps um, shamans or magico-religious practitioners, were afforded more power than they otherwise would have had. And that as environmental conditions got better uh, towards the end of the early woodland period, and you'll just have to trust me, those previous slides showed that like hemlock, which is a very cold tolerant and wet tolerant species, in fact, is, the, is, is sort of an index for cold and wet conditions, spikes right around 3,000 years after really it dropped off in, the, in what we call the mid-Holocene. Lake levels, likewise, really spike around 3,000 years ago, and various other proxies attest to that. So that gets um, into sort of one part of the talk, is, is um, the not so uh, um, straightforward, rationally logical things that we can see in the archeological record that nevertheless um, are quite fascinating and tell a very, very um, complicated and nuanced human story, more than just hunter-gatherers were here until a thousand years ago and then uh, they developed agriculture, which, spoiler alert, I'm gonna be talking about in a minute. Um, that, there's, that there's human, very complex interactions that are taking place at various regional and inter-regional scales and that we need to be mindful that these people are fully human experiencing all sorts of successes and, um, and continuations, but also potentially um, crises and how, they, and how they negotiate that is, yeah. Yeah. Explain the classification of Yes. Um, no, because I don't know most of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, I used to. There's taiga. There's um, the the uh, the yellow is basically mixed forest. Um, uh, the white is obviously glacier, or the blue is obviously glacier or um, tundra desert. Um, the uh, that's about as far as I can tell from now. Yeah, th that's step, um, and then zero is zero theoric, which is basically um, sort of um, uh, dry, dry, yeah, dry desert, and then desert, tundra, step, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it, it was just meant to show how um, the environment has changed over the last 21,000 years. And so at a more local level, uh, a couple years ago, um, or a few years ago, uh, oh, um, I um, 
worked with uh, my colleagues because I, we had been sitting at the state on a lot of archaeological information. Um, and uh, there was a good reason to protect some of that information. Um, if, for those of you, I know Roger and, and Rich are certainly aware, um, quote unquote pot hunting or the, or the um, excavation of Native American archeological sites for the purposes of just gathering materials to put on your mantle or even more um, you know, scarily to sell um, is, is, a, is an omnipresent threat to uh, preservation in Vermont. Uh, it ebbs and it flows, but um, you know, it's always a concern. And as a steward uh, of these uh, um, archeological sites, these, these um, uh, uh, material cultural um, attestments to the Native American presence in Vermont, I have to be very mindful of them. Nevertheless, I knew that there was things that we could do to get some of this information out without compromising specific site locations. And one of them that I knew would be an interesting research tool was um, to go through every report that's ever been filed with the Division for Historic Preservation and um, find every reported radiocarbon date. And when I pitched this to several of my colleagues, they were like, ah, have fun with that. And it actually, with the help of um, some temporary uh, employees of the Vermont Archaeology Heritage Center, our sort of central curation facility and research center, we did it in about a year. And now it's a database you can download online from the archaeological uh, Vermont Archaeology Heritage Center, and we're adding to it periodically as new reports come in. And it's a research tool um, that has been utilized across the country um, because radiocarbon dates are archaeologist lingua franca. They lock within a certain error range uh, archaeological sites into particular periods of time. Um, and then the next thing I did, which um, was, uh, was perhaps uh, more ambitious, it's definitely more ambitious, was to say, well, we have all of these archaeological site reports that have documented food remains that were recovered from archaeological sites. Um, let's put all that together into a big table. And that was, that was ambitious. Um, but with my colleague Brett Ostrom and a few other, um, Scott Dillon, uh, Avon Benny Basque, who work with me at the division, that took us about two years and we recently completed that. that and that's also online to, to download as an Excel um, spreadsheet. And these have both been tools that I, I see from behind the scenes web tracking. You know, people across the world and certainly across the US and uh, our, our neighbors up north in Canada have downloaded quite frequently. And so hopefully this is contributing to a broader um, knowledge about not only the archeology span here, but also uh, the, the paleo environment, the environment before European contact. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. Um, uh, I showed you briefly and somewhat um, haphazardly that um, diagrams of uh, hemlock pollen. And um, the way that that information is derived is extremely laborious. Um, it involves geologists going out into lakes or ponds, usually waiting till it freezes over. They drill a hole down and then they take a sediment core, and, which is basically just a big metal tube, plunge it into the sediment at the bottom of the lake, try to hope they get a very good um, section, which is basically as, as it goes all the way back hopefully into the Pleistocene or 11,000 years ago or so. Um, they pull it up, they cut the tube in half, and then they look at it like a layer cake. Because ponds and, and lakes usually turn over every year, and just like um, ice core rings or tree rings, they record uh, a periodic um, uh, layering, uh, like a layer cake, up through time. And then they do the very laborious process of choosing sections up through the column, usually aided by periodic radiocarbon dates, and counting grains of pollen for each tree species that they want to look at. It is, it is nothing I would want to do. Um, but Nevertheless, many masters and PhD dissertations have, have done one or several sediment cores. Um, and from that, you can get remarkable insight into the paleo environment of a region. There's really only been two or three in Vermont, and here's two cores from high altitude ponds, Ritterbush Pond in Eden and Sterling Pond in Jeffersonville. And they show changes in particular tree species abundance, at least around the area of the pond through time. So you can see birch, around 11,500 years ago is almost non-existent, then it spikes, and then there's you know, peaks and valleys throughout. Um, conversely, this is pine, has a very early predominance around the lake, again, in 11,000, 10,000 years ago, and then dips 
with some variability throughout the rest of the Holocene. Again, um, hemlock is very interesting because it's so um, reactive to cold, and so you can get a good idea, at least one proxy, of how things change over time. Uh, again, not strictly archaeological, but very interesting is that um, a gentleman named uh, Charlie Cogbill and colleagues did uh, something else really um, laborious, but very clever. Some of you might have heard about this. Um, when, when and town lots and, and lot lines and um, property lines were originally established in any given town, um, uh, usually back into the you know, 1700s uh, or mid-1700s, um, there were no rock walls or, or real property markers used at that time. Instead, they would use witness trees. So while most trees were cut down, trees that were in the corners of every lot, they would choose a sort of you know, healthy, um, uh, you know, quite old tree uh, to mark the corners of the lot. And then they would write those in the town records. So Mr. So-and-so's lot is marked on the northern, the northwestern boundary by, um, you know, a 50-year-old chestnut. M you know, Mr. So-and-so's blah, blah, blah. So Charlie Cogbill and his colleagues went through the town records of 760 towns and documented every tree and every witness lot that they could find. And it was really remarkable because after that, you have a baseline forest composition throughout New England, and he spent a lot of his, his time in Vermont, of what the trees were like, you know, again, you know, it, it's a very good sample um, across the region. And what he found was, um, this is, these are all little pie charts, so um, you can't see anything from here, but just look for, at this scale, sort of darker, and then the red that you see here is, is maple. And so what happened is, as we know, the vast majority of the trees were cut down in the 1800s, and then were, there were systematic replanting efforts, and replanting differentially favored maple. So the forests that we look at today are not like the forests in the contact period, the early, the early period. Um, and to give you an idea, I broke this down into percentages. And what is the most common uh, tree? Uh, beech, by far, 36% of all of the total of all the towns they looked at in, in, uh, in Vermont, or in New England. Excuse me? Uh, well, he says, he says um, you know, European contact, but it's really about 1750. Although nothing had really gone on before that, no large scale deforestation. So he, he surmises that it represents sort of the quote unquote primordial forest. Although we know Native Americans were actually you know, actively managing forest lands throughout time, at least throughout the Holocene. So, um, you know, the forests were constantly changing, nevertheless, not to the sort of, um, you know, wholesale destruction of the forest like occurred, you know, in the mid 1800s. Um, and then next, maples, spruces, hemlocks. Um, interesting though, butternut is extremely rare. And in Vermont, um, oh yeah, these are only for Vermont. In Vermont, chestnut is almost non-existent. So um, even though chestnut has essentially been extirpated now, it was never very common in Vermont, which is quite interesting because um, archaeologically, we know chestnut in southern New England, uh, chestnuts were considered um, the bread of Native Americans. Chestnut flour was a, a very, very important staple, and it was probably not really available in all, but probably in southernmost Vermont, down here perhaps. Um, other things to consider paleoenvironmentally is that, um, is that uh, Vermont is pretty interesting in that uh, we have three zones to our forests that are really broken out quite distinctly uh, based upon altitude. So um, we have mixed forests, you know, deciduous forests up to about 2,800 uh, feet. And then if you look at any of the big uh, green mountains, right around that line, it's quite distinct. It becomes boreal forest. Um, and then at the tops of the highest peaks in Vermont and in New Hampshire, you have remnant tundra, basically plants that were introduced at the end of the Pleistocene, and because it's so, uh, the temperature is so cold on average down there, um, it, um, it preserves this tundra-like environment. Um, there used to be more, but now really the only two tundra plant communities left are a little bit on Mount Mansfield, a little bit on Camel Sump, and a little bit on uh, Mount Abe. And that's when you hike up to those tall peaks and it says rare vegetation, don't walk on it. That's what it is. It, essentially, you're walking back in time. You're walking through the deciduous forest, that's the later Holocene, up into the early Holocene, or around 8,000 years ago when you get into the boreal forest, and then all the way back into uh, the time of the woolly mammoths and everything in the Pleistocene when you get to the highest peaks. 
So it's an interesting perspective. So anyway, um, returning to our initiative, we said, uh, okay, let's look at what we have for um, food remains. And actually, um, quite surprisingly, even though it took a long time, there wasn't that much information. I was, I was uh, mildly um, disappointed, but nevertheless, a critical resource. Here's some of the sites, actually all of the sites that were used in this um, uh, analysis that had um, uh, food remains, either um, food bone or uh, plant remains that could be analyzed. And through this, this is again not statistically um, uh, rigorous, I'm running some st statistics on it now. These are general incidences through time, but you can see that all the way from about 5,000 years ago, and five, it, what, one of the interesting things, interesting things about this um, exercise was that it really appears like 5,000 years ago is a pretty hard line for preservation in Vermont. Before that, we know that they were burning um, you know, fires and eating food and you know, um, killing animals for food, but the preservation is horrible. We, it is, it is you know, one time in 100 we might find remains before 5,000 years ago. Some of that is also the rarity of the sites themselves. But after 5,000 years ago, preservation seems to be fairly decent and we can have some, some numbers that at least tell us something. And that's um, that it largely mirrors, with some fluctuations, the, um, the forest composition that Charlie Cogbill documented at Contact, which is that beech predominates in, in, every, single, um, in every single spike except for the three to 2,000 years ago is quite interesting because that's when I surmise there might have been some environmental um, perturbations. Again, just reminding you of that. And then nuts. Um, this was one of the things we looked at. These are the edible uh, nut species, or at least the predominant ones available in Vermont. Butternut, there's also black walnut, um, but butternut's a walnut species. Beech nut, hazelnut, hickory nut, and acorn. Acorn requires processing to be edit edible. Um, it requires leaching the tannins out of it, and so it's a little bit laborious. It's usually done, at least as we, um, um, as has been recorded in ethno historically, by um, grinding them and sort of into meal, not into powder, but then uh, putting them in baskets and then putting them in running water for a few days, which will leach the tannins out. And then it can be made into flour. Um, and interestingly, uh, what we see here is that butternut predominates in every single time period. Uh, even though butternut trees are one of the rarest trees you can have in Vermont, which, which indicates to me that uh, butternuts were tasty. Um, I don't, I'm allergic to nuts, um, uh, but, so I can't uh, taste test any of these, but uh, what it really means is that they were, uh, Native Americans were going to significant lengths to accrue butternuts, probably traveling to you know, quite you know, significant distance perhaps, depending upon where they were, to um, collect butternuts. Uh, and conversely, despite the predominance of beech nuts, um, they weren't that common. Now, I haven't had a beech nut. They might be really gross, um, or perhaps they're not that nutritious. Um, but they're, they're relative to the tree abundance, that ubiquity is not represented in the, in the record. So it's, it's quite interesting. And then, again, proving the way I started this talk um, is that um, uh, there's records of cultigens in Vermont, quite rare. Uh, but we see, again, around, not until around 1000 AD do we see maize, beans, squash um, emerge in Vermont and, and the turn towards sustained, intensive, relatively intensive agriculture. Um, but there is evidence of kenopodium, which is a seed that was, um, that was sort of um, passively uh, uh, raised in a sort of limited horticulture. Uh, it's, it's a weed, it's also called marsh elder. Um, and we also have a uh, 25 year old, uh, 2500 year old sunflower from uh, Route 78, showing that there was um, the limited practice of horticulture even before the advent of sustained agriculture. And I'll just go through these quickly. Um, food bone remains were actually quite rare. Deer is the most common, as you might imagine. Um, and then a, a, a menagerie of other things, um, including uh, bear, fox, fisher, skunk, weasel, beaver, uh, flying squirrel, uh, white-footed mouse. Uh, but not one moose have we ever documented in Vermont, which is very interesting. Nor uh, a, a definitively documented elk, um, 
even though we, there are several early records in the 1700s of, um, of elk being taken in Vermont. Um, some of those might be in the Artiodactyla other or order, which just means that we know that they were in that um, family or, or you know, group of species, but couldn't be identified further. But nevertheless, quite interesting. And then fish, um, again, not really any open lake fish. That is largely probably a result of archeological sampling um, because most of the lakeside sites along Lake Champlain where the deep water fish would be um, have been developed over. And so we don't have that window into probably open water fishing camps. So what we see are riverine fish, uh, most commonly bullhead uh, catfish. Um, there are some salmon, sturgeon, pike walleye. And so this is, a, this is a, a, a seasonal round. You probably can't see it here. But I, I developed it from um, information from uh, the Jesuit relations, uh, the 1612 um, Jesuit relation of Father Barrett when he talks about Micmac um, subsistence rounds in quite good detail. And um, he begins in uh, January with, uh, with um, this taking of seal. And again, this is, we'd have to augment it because this is coastal and we're interior, but the taking of seal, then moving to beaver and otter, um, and then moose, bear, caribou, and then anadromous fish, smelt, uh, then followed by herring, salmon, sturgeon, and then moving into their summer fishing season, augmented by berries and shellfish, um, which again would be different in here in the interior, um, and then eels, uh, the small mammals, waterfowl, um, and, then, uh, and then finally finishing up the year with tomcod run. And we can sort of, again, projecting into the interior a similar seasonal movements um, throughout time until um, uh, the late woodland period. And I'm staring at the clock, so I know I have a little bit of time, but I'm just going to run through the middle woodland period uh, and jump to the late woodland period here. Basically, uh, the short um, summary here in the middle woodland period is um, populations, at least if it can be judged by the numbers and sizes of sites relative to the previous early woodland period, explodes. We see um, pottery elaboration that is you know, remarkable. Sizes of sites get quite large. Um, uh, the numbers of sites increase more than double. Um, and yet, uh, in terms of mortuary ceremonialism or burials, uh, there's never been a single one identified in Vermont, meaning that the energy invested in, 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 in cemeteries and, in, and burial ritual seems to have um, really dropped. And again, my hypothesis is that might have been a return to more normalized conditions, but, um, and again, just cycling through. So then we get to the late woodland period. And um, uh, this is when um, the evidence is now pretty firmly coalesced on the emergence of uh, uh, sustained corn, beans, squash agriculture. Um, there's been a few sort of key sites that have documented this, the most recent of which is uh, um, uh, the Route 78 excavations in Swanton, um, located in the, really in the heart of the Missisquoi Abnaki homeland. Um, this is for a, a proposed road widening project. And this is sort of difficult to see at this resolution, but um, you can see the, the um, purple are middle archaic, so going all the way back to 7,000 years ago. There's one little um, purple dot that is documented that they found through all their excavations along the route. And actually, this is a little bit backwards because this is further toward the town of Swanton, and the upper one is more out on the delta. And then um, you can see early woodland, again, almost not exist in a few little patches. Middle woodland is the blue. You can, be, you can begin to see blue. Um, uh, you know, getting quite large populations emerging. And then late woodland is actually throughout. And, the, and what we can see is that uh, the Native American farmers were moving way out onto the delta um, uh, and utilizing probably all that area for agricultural fields. Um, there's just an overview of that. And some of the remarkable things that came out of these excavations, um, this is a floodplain, a very dynamic floodplain. And floodplain or alluvial settings are very important uh, archaeological site um, locations because uh, they preserve archaeological uh, material culture like a layer cake, meaning someone down here 
uh, a group of people came, you know, roughly 3,000 years ago, let's say, down here, um, camped, did whatever they did for uh, a day, a week, a month, left, and then sometime after a flood came, capped that with sterile soil. Sometime after that, another group of people came, camped, did whatever they were going to do, left, another flood. And so through, you can read these layers of soil like the layers, like the chapters of a book, except in reverse, going from deepest, oldest, all the way to the top, to the most recent. And just to give you an idea how complex some of these settings were, this is uh, just people documenting various things at their lab station. All of these black bands represent individual occupations. So, you know, just, you know, probably 50 or 60 represented right there. Individual what? Occupations, meaning events of habitation. Yeah. Um, quite a, a, a good amount of um, late woodland pottery. But perhaps most remarkably, um, the, the, um, the uh, recognition of the first uh, definitive longhouse pattern in Vermont. And this is interesting because um, longhouses, the traditional quote unquote longhouse, is considered to be sort of an Iroquoian house type, although we know that um, uh, it was utilized uh, by all groups throughout the, the, um, the Northeast, but part and parcel with the adoption of agriculture. People needed to stay in, um, in one place to tend to their crops, to plant, to watch them, um, to, to make it through harvest, and that necessitated you know, a great deal more sedentism. And so longhouse design seems to have been amenable to this form. We don't know if they partitioned space like the Abnaki did, I mean the, the Iroquois did, where they would have um, you know, subsections of the longhouse be uh, family dwellings, but it's possible. Um, this is, is very much like a uh, late woodland longhouse, and you can't see it yet, but just wait, because this took a long time to do. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, it's roughly, they only got uh, about two thirds of it on one side, um, but it's, it's about 300 feet long, they hypothesize. So, this was me fooling around with SketchUp a little bit just to give you an idea of what it would have looked like. Um, and again, this was on um, Ziscoy uh, Wildlife Refuge land. And so uh, federal land requires uh, a lot of um, uh, care when um, excavating archaeological re remains, particularly if they're not directly threatened. And so the deal that um, the, the Missisquoi Wildlife uh, Manager and um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife came up with was that they would um, avoid this longhouse. Um, it wasn't going to be directly in the path of the road. It was, um, and then they would uncover it to this level, map it, take a few small soil samples for radiocarbon dating, and then just cover it back over again. So it's actually perfectly preserved, still in place. And then uh, Pete Thomas, who um, uh, did a lot of uh, work with the Sokoki, um archaeological sites at Fort Hill or archaeological village at Fort Hill um, came up with this map which shows sort of how things changed once agriculture uh, began to be adopted. Um, uh, and you can see that maize, the, the harvest, um, and then relying on maize through the winter um, became uh, quite an important thing, but nevertheless augmented quite significantly with hunting uh, anadromous fishing waterfowl. Um, less like the Iroquois, which really invested a great deal of time and energy into um, agricultural products. Um, let's see. All right, I got about five minutes left, I think, so. Um, the Intervale is another quite important location uh, with evidence of uh, agriculture. Um, one of the earliest sites uh, documented in the late 1970s, it's called the Corn Cob Site in the, in the Intervale. Uh, area, and it was called that somewhat um, uh, uncleverly because um, in this particular feature uh, here in the wall, and by feature I mean the remnants of a fire hearth, and here's a partially excavated, um, there was the remains of a, a full carbonized corn carb, cob that dated to right around 1100 AD, and then classic late woodland pottery. These were, these were this is a, a, as a very brief aside, this is a cautionary tale about um, slides and that um, 
these slides are, you know, rapidly yellowing and disintegrating, and, you know, archaeologists have thousands of slides, and so there's a race against time to get them digitally scanned. You can see how this one is yellowed, and same with this one. And then further up, um, another site um, uh, near uh, National Guard Road in, uh, in South Burlington behind the airport, uh, the remains of another uh, likely agricultural village. Um, only parts of it could be excavated that were directly going to be impacted by the redesign of the National Guard base behind there. Um, but ultimately, 220 meters of excavation took place uh, over the summer, which is very large for an archaeological site in Vermont. And this is a very interesting site because um, the, the remains of maize were found. Um, the, it's likely that the remains of a longhouse were found, although we had no clarity like the one up at Route 78. It was more the alignment of the fire pits and the storage pits. But this site is, is one of my favorites in Vermont because um, we ran five radiocarbon dates on this site. And um, you can see there's two up in the woods there, one on maize or, or corn, one on butternut, um, and then two over in the big block excavations, uh, or three, uh, one on maize, one on butternut, one on hop hornbeam. Oh, and parenthetically, all of these blue dots represent pits that contained Native American artifacts in them. And so you can see potentially how huge this village area was, although we only looked in areas that were going to be directly developed. Anyway, all five radiocarbon dates came back exactly the same. That never happens in Vermont. And, um, and so really, the, we can lock down pretty close to 1315 AD is when uh, this village was occupied. Um, we got very lucky. It was, it was right, the, the heart of where we excavated was right near the road, um, but preserved this, this living surface. All that black layer is, is um, organically enriched soil from living on it. Um, and you can see right above it a beer bottle from the uh, road fill. So it was very serendipitously preserved. And we'll just scroll through some of these here. Um, very characteristic bell-shaped storage jar uh, or storage pit um, for corn. And then, uh, let's see, what do I have here? And then um, I think I'll finish up with, uh, in the northernmost area of, um, of Vermont, in, in Alberg, um, a site that was excavated in the early 2000s, um, uh, which um, called the Bohannon site, which was surmised, um, and still is by some, to be um, a St. Lawrence Iroquoian site. Basically, uh, an incursion of St. Lawrence Iroquois either prior to European contact, or it, the radiocarbon dates attest that, um, into the northern Champlain Valley. And uh, I was uh, a young field technician on this site, and so I was on it and excavated there for two years. Um, here's just an overview of the very large site. These, again, probably contained longhouse-like dwellings too, but there wasn't that resolution to see post molds and other things. Um, and very um, characteristic pipes, um, series of radiocarbon dates on corn going all the way back to about 1000 AD and then all the way up uh, through 1600. The remains of, you know, that's what one corn kernel looks like when it's 1000 years old. Looks like a kernel of corn. Um, a wide variety of uh, food remains. Um, but I'd like to finish up by saying that, um, that uh, I remember seeing a lecture by um, Dr. Fred Wiseman a number of years ago where he cautioned against um, attributing these sites in the Champlain Valley to uh, St. Lawrence Iroquoians, that, the, that um, you know, it had political ramifications, um, and that was part of his argument. But um, just on pure uh, archaeological evidence, he was of the mind that it, that it wasn't, um, that pots, quote unquote, didn't equal people. And, um, I have to say that as I have grown into, you know, a, um, a more mature archaeologist through the 20 years or so I've been doing archaeology, um, I find the evidence that um, these sites are St. Lawrence Iroquoian to be less and less compelling, and I am more inclined now to believe um, uh, the archaeological evidence and um, what uh, Fred and other Abnaki were saying early on, that this was just a compelling pottery style that was actually utilized all across the Northeast, not only among Iroquoians, but actually among Algonquian potters as well. And, and that um, if you look very closely, the permutations and mixing of, of decorative motifs um, 
uh, are something different than you see up on the St. Lawrence proper, where we know that these groups of St. Lawrence Iroquoians um, did, uh, did dwell and um, disappeared quite mysteriously. Um, and so because it's 807, I think I'll leave it there. I didn't even get to the contacts, so you'll have to invite me back next year. All right, thanks. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, UVM has been, well, this is interesting. Um, there w might be one that's co-run by us this coming year. Um, it would be at the Intervale, okay. and it would be in partnership with the Intervale Center, um, and hopefully with um, uh, um, uh, the University of Vermont, because so it could be run for credit. Yeah. Uh, but that's in very preliminary. Okay. Otherwise, um, uh, it wouldn't be UVM's year to run a Vermont field school. Mm -hmm. It would either be in the Southwest or in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, and so um, just shoot me an email and I can give you some other um, uh, field schools that okay. would be. Thanks. But thanks for asking. Yeah? Not so mysterious about the St. Lawrence Airport. Simply is Cartier comes in in what, 1530s? It gives them all sorts of disease. It yep. into a fight with the Eurons. This is in Jesuit relations again. Yep. And later, Algonquin chiefs explaining to some of the Jesuits that used to be all our grandfather's land up north there. And they said, well, what happened to them? So the Hurons took many of the people with them that were survived, um, and everybody else broke up. Some went to the Algonquin, some went to the Abenaki, the Wabanaki people, some went to the Iroquois. And that's typically what happened. We don't disappear. Right. <laughs> we don't ex go extinct. What we end up doing is moving in. Well, yeah, you're exactly yeah. right, and that's a great, you know, qualification. There wasn't, um, you know, aliens didn't come down and, you know, you know, remove them all. Something happened cataclysmic. The way they hmm? the way they <laughs> Don't watch Ancient Aliens, please. <laughs> I mean, their styles of the flavors. <laughs> right. Easily exactly. Spread out and and like, you see that, and there's documentation of that, like you said in the Jesuit relations, that, um, that there's a fleeing from the St. Lawrence proper um, to places like Norwich Walk, perhaps to the Champlain. So people were um, moving in with distant kin. Um, the, the, like Roger said, the only um, documentation, European documentation, of the St. Lawrence Iroquois is Cartier himself, who went to Hachalega and Stadacona, two villages. Hachalega is, is now in present day, was in present day Montreal, or however you phrase that. Um, and you know, some people have said that like you intimated, St. Lawrence Iroquoians might not even even been Iroquoian. Um, they were, they, they were we had traditional. We were at war with them for years upon years, and you will find you go up into parts of Micmac country in New Brunswick, and the old timers will tell you they'll, they'll find a point. And they'll be like, "Oh, that's Iroquois made because we didn't work in stone. We worked in bone and ivory." Well, that's that, that's exactly that's so exactly right. We traditionally. We know they were there. They were an enemy of, of our people for a long time. Yeah, and, and like Roger said, something happened post-Cartier. Like he, he intimated, the Huron might have come in. Cartier, um, people were trading at, um, out in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, going all the way back to the early 1500s. And all of a sudden, the St. Lawrence Corridor became a very um, important territory to get out to those early fishermen and those trading routes. That combined, like you said, with disease, like um, the incursions from the Huron, who were very powerful, and also uh, the emergent Mohawk um, uh, would have likely caused a bunch of um, political, social um, implications that, like you said, caused uh, the St. Lawrence Iroquoians to um, move in with neighbors. To, some, um, it's been hypothesized, moved in with Huron, or got assimilated with Huron, however you want to say it, moved in with Algonquian and Abnaki groups, uh, moved with the Micmac. Um, but um, by the time the next wave of Europeans comes into the interior of St. Lawrence, which is Champlain, um, those areas uh, are not like Cartier wrote about. There, there's a different political landscape. So it's a great, it's a great um, yeah, um, thing to follow there. Area. Yeah. Yeah. Could you tell a little bit about pottery? So you 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 found pottery in some of the sites, not I assume not all of them. Were you able to identify where the 
clays were coming from? Yeah, that's a good question too. People um, have been doing uh, clay sourcing studies, um, and, and in particular with the St. Lawrence Iroquoian-like pottery from um, Alberg, from Bohannon site, there was a study run. It was never published, but I believe John Kroc from UVM has the unpublished results. And um, much like Roger was saying, the pottery, the clay from which the pottery was made is from all over the place. It's not from one source, nor is it particularly local to any one region. It's, it's all over, meaning that there was a lot of either movement of people or trade in pots or, um, or very complex social negotiations or movement of actual people that belie just a simple, oh, this, this decorative motif means it was made by St. Lawrence Iroquois. Um, and that, that's actually a good point. I should find out whatever happened to that study. But in general, those are very, um, clay sourcing studies are important. They've been done in many areas of, uh, of uh, North America and the world, really. Um, Southwest does, Southwestern uh, pottery is routinely uh, subject to you know, um, sourcing analysis, but it's rarely done in the Northeast. I wish, more, I wish more people would do it. Yeah? How much do we know about population numbers at different periods? Yeah, this is, this is a, a question I get asked a lot. And uh, you know, I, um, I, I occasionally teach classes at UVM, and um, people ask, my students ask me that as well. And the answer I give is that um, it is the toughest uh, and most um, uh, <laughs> thankless task in archaeology is to try to estimate populations at particular periods in the past. It's difficult enough in places like um, Mesoamerica where you, there is, a, there is a, a written record and um, you, know, you can get ideas of population densities from the cores of cities and peripheries. Um, but here it's very, very difficult indeed. What do you use as indicators? And um, people have done very complex, very rationally rigorous analyses of populations only to publish their results and immediately be taken to task um, because it's just totally ridiculous. And so people have stopped kind of doing it. There's just too many, too many ways to poke holes in any given argument. Um, um, and so, you know, a lot of it comes down to, unfortunately, a lot of it comes down to minimization meaning they were hunter-gatherers, and uh, it, there's still a paper that was published in, I think it was 77, which calculated what's the minimum number of individuals you need to sort of overcome sort of the you know, genetic uh, bottlenecks and stochastic variation and all that stuff, you know, a viable, healthy population. And it's somewhere around uh, 75 to 100 individuals. And so awfully, often, bands are attributed to 75 to 100 individuals, and then how many bands could fit in Vermont? Well, you know, that goes back and forth. But I think those are grossly underestimated numbers. I think that it was much, much larger than that, depending upon the period of time. You know, certainly in the late woodland period, thousands and thousands of people. Um, um, you know, moving seasonally, not sedentary by any means. Um, uh, but um, again, it's a difficult nut to crack. Yeah. I have a question about the textile markings on the on the shards of the pottery. Yeah, uh, I imagine that they, they the textile is wrapped around the paddle. Yes, and the paddle is beaten against the. Side. It's not really beaten; it's like pressed. Well, uh, uh, to make a the, the wall of a pot, you yep. have an anvil stone on the inside and a paddle on the outside, and you beat the the outside of the of the pot, and it would form a thinner a thinner. Um, uh, profile, at least in other places. And I, what my question was, uh, do you think this textile marking was strictly a, 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 an artifact of the manufacturer, or was a design, a, a, really an intended design? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so first part is, um, actually, the vast majority of um, pottery that we've documented in the Northeast that can be analyzed with any degree of specificity, specificity um, seems to indicate that they were made by coiling, in which case you pile up sequential coils and then smooth the, the, you know, the, the breaks in between the coils. And that was probably done with paddling. So that's a manufacturing 
in answering the manufacturing question until perhaps uh, the late woodland period where they might have done that paddle thing like you're talking about. Vessels get much bigger in general. Um, I am of the opinion that um, nearly everything that uh, Native Americans, the Abnaki here in the Northeast did, and all humans in general has a, has a big social component. And that you know, very little is purely utilitarian, particularly something as important as, and as um, symbolically you know, um, representative as pottery is. Um, so I think it probably had some um, social component, cultural component, um, perhaps signaled different things. You know, there's, there's um, in, in areas with more resolution, people have looked at, you know, the, the, the specific micro motifs like, indiv you know, individual tools and, and try to identify individual potters and the range of techniques that they would use in any given area. We don't really have that resolution yet, but it's like on my 10 year plan is, is, you know, eventually getting to that level. Again, yeah. One of the things that are happening today is we have a lot of weavers on the people, and those pieces pottery were actually being used to show them what styles of weave because so much has been lost. Mm -hmm. Not all the different styles of weaves people know. But by looking at the pottery, they're actually able to recreate it and they're making bags and stuff like that all the time. Which is, you know, that, that you know, warms my heart, honestly, because, uh, you know, um, I'm very cognizant as an archaeologist about, um, about telling the story of real people in the past, but not, not telling, telling a story or the, the story that the material remains suggest, which is incomplete. Um, and that um, we can't tell the story. And that um, there's certain aspects that we will never understand as archaeologists. Um, and that I learned from the Abnaki and Native American groups across uh, this continent uh, continually. Um, and that, um, that um, archeological, at least recovery, data recovery can inform um, you know, some aspect of modern um, Abnaki art artistry is, is wonderful. It, it wasn't always that way. So I'm, I'm, you know, makes me really happy. Any other questions? Yeah. So switching around a lot, it's always surprising to me that beach was so predominant one point. I just, I don't know if that's something you think about. I, you know, I am not um, a, a plant biologist, so I can't tell you what particular soil or, or environmental or whatever um, conditions allowed, or just, you know, um, uh, seed, you know, blowing or seed carrying trajectories that allowed beach to establish itself here in Vermont over other species. Um, I just know that both Cogbill and, you know, less, less statistically rigorous, more impressionistic, our remains, uh, you know, plant remains from the archaeological record tell that same story. Um, and that, again, that maple, as important as it is to us, is sort of an art, you know, an artifact of the 1860s onward. Um, it was, it was still a predominant species, just not nearly as predominant as, as it is now. Yeah. So there's another point to that, that one of the things I've been taught is that coming back after the glacier, that the oak came back and that it was blue jays that kept on planting them ahead. And I don't know if you could. Well, I mean, that was certainly one vector for seed d dissemination, but certainly not the only one. And in fact, oak was an early, early species um, to come in. But before that, there was you know, at least a millennia of um, first spruce and then um, uh, pine. Um, and, you know, there's a period where it was really, um, if you can imagine, if you've ever been to like the Jersey Pine Barrens or something, it was like that very, very pretty resource poor in terms of, uh, you know, um, tree species until these deciduous tree, uh, tree species could A, be brought in, but until the temperature warmed enough and the conditions allowed it to be brought in. So it wasn't like, you know, the ice moved and then, you know, the forest like we have today moved in. 
It was a very, very gradual process over several millennia, and really probably until about 7,000 years ago. Yeah? Interesting on beach, uh, beach trees. You know, beach is like the number one food source of black bears for fattening for the winter. And if you could feed bears, you could feed humans. Yeah. You know, you know, there. Yeah, I mean. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very fat, rich, and protein rich uh, source of food. Yeah, I, I mean, I, people, at, I gave a, a you know, a, um, I mentioned that particular aspect of the talk in another area, and people said, no, beech nuts are great. So, I, you know, like I said, I wish I could do a, my taste test myself, but I'd end up in the hospital. Um, uh, but um, for some reason, it was a less preferred food, at least with the limited sample we have now. And again, preservation is a huge problem in the Northeast in general, in archaeological all right, well, thanks, folks.